Look at Psalm 127 and verse number 3. It says, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. It's God's design when a man and woman come together. He said, be fruitful, plenish the earth, and multiply. Amen? He said, here's one of the things that marriage is supposed to produce. It's supposed to produce children. And those children are the, are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you that children are not a reward of the state. The state did not reward us with children. The state didn't give us children. Now, the state believes they have the right because they gave you a marriage license. Did you know that? Did you know that what a license is? A license is permission to do something that will be illegal without it. And so in extreme cases, when the state wants to take away a children, if you have a marriage license, they say, we gave you permission to have children. But you didn't really. God gave us children. And God gave us a permission, not only permission, but the commandment to have children. Amen? So when a man and woman marry, the result is going to be children. And those children are a reward from the Lord. They were given to me by God. And uh, they belong to God. He gave them to me. I am, I am there to, to, to train those children, take care of those children, and so that they can then go out and they can be productive citizens and especially productive Christians for the Lord. Amen? And so uh, uh, that's what we got. Then, then God says, go, go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. And God tells us then that as parents, we are to bring them into the world, but then we are to bring them up in the world. Amen? So we bring them into the world, and then we are to bring them up in the world. Ephesians chapter number 6 with me. I'm going to get there quickly with one hand. I can't turn as fast as you do. Ephesians chapter 6, and look at verse number 4. It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So God says, bring children in the world, now then bring them up. Now notice he puts the onus of that on the father. Now what we've done, in a lot of, what a lot of men have done is they've placed a responsibility on their wives. Wives are a part of that because we're one flesh. But the ultimate responsibility and accountability be placed on the father. If my children don't grow up the way they're supposed to, I can't blame my wife for it. My wife is the one who helps me. And by the way, my wife did most of the raising of our children, and most women do most of the raising of their children. But the responsibility God places upon the Father, leadership. God is always a God of leadership and authority. Anything with two heads belongs in a freak show. God does, make, does not make anything run by a committee. It's always run by God through a man or an authority. Amen. It's the way God does things. Yeah, it's not the way we want to do things, but it's the way God does things. And, and we as human beings have trouble submitting to authority. Let's just be honest. We don't like somebody telling us what to do. We don't like it when somebody has the rule and we think that we ought to have the rule. You see it with Moses and the children of Israel. You know, well, you take too much upon you, Miriam and Aaron, and Korah, and it's there. It's in our nature. It came with the Adamic nature. What that simply was, was God gave them a commandment, don't eat. And they decided that they didn't want to follow that commandment, and they ate. And they cast all of us into a condition where we, we don't like to really listen to commandments. You tell a child something, they don't like it. Amen? That's their nature. We're born with that. And as Christians, we have to subdue that nature and bring ourselves into submission to God and God's authorities. Amen? Now, in the home, the authority is the Father. Go with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. So uh, one of my greatest responsibilities as a human being, as a parent, once I had children, my greatest responsibility is the training of my children. I would say this, if you're successful in business but you fail in training your children, you will not be a happy person. I have never met a parent who was happy when their children didn't turn out right. And you can, uh, you know, you can be a success, you can be a, a success at everything in the world and you're not a success as a parent it's going to break your heart, amen? And I'd rather lose money than lose my kids, amen? I'd rather lose everything in this world than lose my family, amen? The family is so important, and children are so important. And I understand something that uh, the Bible says, as arrows in the hands of the mighty man, so are children of thy youth. 
What a, in, in, in that day and age, if you realize that they didn't have somebody manufacture arrows for them. You realize that they made their own arrows. So they went out and they cut a, 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 a tree, a, a stick, a limb off of a certain type of tree, some hard tree that could be hardened, that was true and straight, that could be polished. And then they made the arrowhead, then they put the, the feathers on there and made the knock for that. And they, they made an arrow that, that, to the best of their ability, that was true and sound. And then at some point in that life, they had to pull that arrow back, and they had to let that arrow go. They pointed it at a target and said, this is where I want it to fly, this is what I want it to hit. But they had to let it go. That's what parenting is. As, 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 arrows, as arrows in a quiver, uh, so are the children of thy youth. Amen. As arrows in a mighty hand. A happiest man had this quiver full. So when I got these children, God gave me something that was unshaped and untrained. And I had to make out of it a true arrow. I had to make sure that I made it straight. I had to make sure that I made it strong. I had to make sure that I supplied it with everything it needed to fly correctly. But at some point, I had to take my children and aim them and say, there's where I want you to go, kids. Now you're on your own. And it's sad that we don't find out until we let them go on their own how good a job we did or how a good job they did. There are two phases of this. I don't want to beat anybody up. I have seen guys beat up uh, people because their children failed. I want to say something to you. If you did not fail to train properly, then your children failed to learn properly. Amen. I know there are those that want to beat people up because their kids didn't turn out right. But you understand something? Uh, Samuel's kids didn't turn out right either. And God didn't beat him up. Now, God beat up Eli, Eli, but Eli knew what his sons were doing and didn't deal with it. Amen. And you got to be careful now. But you understand something? My job is to do the best I can to produce an arrow that's going to fly true and straight and going to hit the mark. And then when I let it go... I'm not in charge. By the way, sometimes they go astray, not because they were f f faulty, but because of the influences. Go out here and try to shoot an arrow east and west with this north wind today and see if, uh, where it's going to go. Whew. Amen. And so sometimes uh, when you look at your children and they mess up, you've got to realize that maybe there were some influences after they left your home that, that they didn't deal with properly, and so they have gone astray. One thing I love about it, the prodigal son is in that book right there, amen? And my, I was a prodigal son, and thank God if you're saved, God will never leave you nor forsake you, nor will he ever stop dealing with you, amen, and amen. And I thank God for that. That's encouraging to a parent. Now look at, uh, look at Deuteronomy chapter chapter number 6, and look at verse 6 with me. Here we have instruction from God. He says, and, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So first parent, get them in your heart. Look, if they're not in your heart, if you don't have a passion about them, your kids are going to see that. If you don't really love the Word of God, if you don't really love truth, if you don't really love righteousness, your kids are going to see that. You can't fool your kids. Don't you ever believe that you can fool children. You cannot fool children. Children are very astute. They are very discerning. They are more discerning than adults are. When we get to be adults, we get stupid. And when we're children, they're so innocent, but they're also discerning. They know. They can see right through all that baloney. Amen. They know it. So it needs to be in our heart. And then verse 7, And thou shalt teach them diligently. So here we see instruction, and we see it's diligent. What does diligent mean? Diligent means with an, a concentrated and, and earnest and, and, and expended effort. It's not just a casual thing. I'm, I'm not just supposed to just kind of think that, well, I just teach, and, you know, I'm supposed to be diligent about it. I, I'm supposed to make it a focus. I'm supposed to put in the effort. Amen. I, I'm supposed to, uh, it's supposed to be an a, a, a important part of my, 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 my life to make sure that I'm teaching my children what they need to know. Can I tell you something? Your children have to learn, and they're going to learn, but who are they going to learn from? You understand something, if they don't learn from you, they're going to learn from somebody else. I want to tell you something else. You understand something, while they're learning from you, they are also learning from others. 
And so you must be diligent about this. You must be aware of where your children are, what they're being influenced by, uh, who's impacting their life, who is a part of their life. And I'll tell you, in my own personal appearance, my own personal experience, if you're not careful about who your kids are with and you don't foresee things, you'll end up with some problems you wish you had not had, but you just were ignorant, you weren't diligent about making sure you kept an eye on things. Amen. You say, well, you know, I, just, I, don't, I know you feel like being a parent makes you feel like you're, bad, you're, you're mad and you're bad all the time. Being a parent makes you feel like you're a grouch. Being a parent makes you feel like you say, no, 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 no. Don't you get tired of saying no? Yeah, but you have to do that. That's part of parenting. And by the way, being the dad, being the head of the home, sometimes you're going to have mom and the kids mad at you. If you're going to be the kind of dad you're supposed to be, mom and the kids are both going to be mad at you. Just the way it is. You just got to man up, fellas. You just got to be a man and get a backbone and accept it's a part of the responsibility. You know, wives are the weaker vessel. Please don't get mad at me, ladies. And that, that's who the devil went to to bring about sin into that home, to bring about compromise. And wives can have their heartstrings, pull, their heartstrings pulled by those little kids and want to give in to things that are not proper. And dad has to be the mean old guy that puts down his foot and says no. Well, let me say this. Always try to make your home as fun as you can. And always try to say yes as much as you can. Amen. And, 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 and don't be an old grouch until you, unless you have to be a grouch. Amen. And so there's a balance, but, uh, but teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou rise up. In other words, every opportunity is a teaching opportunity. Every opportunity is an opportunity to impart knowledge and wisdom and understanding to your children. I used to drive down the road and see somebody doing something. I'd say to my kids, you know, that's not right. See what they're doing? That's not, God's not pleased with that. And we're not mad at them, we love them, but he's not pleased with that behavior. And that's not what we should do. Every opportunity, you should be teaching your children. And I'm talking about spiritual things, but I'm still talking about the things of life. Teach your children how to work. Teach them the way to do things right and the way to not do things. But teach them how to clean their room. I mean, teach them, teach them how to get out of bed. Teach them to read their Bible and pray. There's all kinds of things. Brother Brian Sharp, a great evangelist, when his boy turned, uh, I think it was uh, 11 years old, every year for his birthday, he got a new tool. The first year, he got a shovel. He said, now from now on, son, you're a man. From now on, you're not going to get kids' tools. You're going to get men's tools. You're going to learn how to use them. So he asked me one time, what's the best thing you can teach your boys? Teach them how to work. You teach them how to work, they'll never want for anything. Teach them how to work. Teach them how to be hard workers. My dad used to say, man gives you a job, you give him eight hours work for eight hours pay. Amen. My daddy taught me to work at 10 years of age. He said, right there's the lawnmower, there's the gas, there's the oil. I provide it. You might mow my yard free. Now you're not sitting around all summer going to the swimming pool and playing. You're going to work. And I've been working since I was 10 years of age. I was working before that in my dad's shop for nothing. And I worked in my dad's shop for basically nothing until I graduated from a junior, a junior college. But I didn't work for nothing because he gave me some money at the end of every week if I needed some. And he put food on my, on my table and he put clothes on my back and he put a roof over my head. Amen. He taught me how to work and not expect somebody to pay you for it. Amen. I started working at 16, and uh, I started driving a water truck for a co-op at 16, which was against the law because the, the, they knew that I was, I was responsible and I would work. They knew I wouldn't sit out under some shade tree somewhere and take a 25, 30-minute break when I was supposed to be driving the truck and working because my daddy taught me that. He didn't just teach me that you get what you inspect, not what you expect. <laughs> And my daddy left something to do at home when I got off from school. About 20 minutes, about 15 minutes after I got home, he was walking in the shop door to make sure I was out there doing it. And Katie barred the door if I wasn't out there doing it. Amen. My daddy had something that was really effective. He had a belt. Amen. Uh, I was hyperactive. I was ADHD. I tell folks now I'm just ADD because I can't do the hyperactive anymore. I'm too old. Amen. But my daddy fixed it, not with Ritalin. He fixed it with Padlins. Amen. He got her done. Amen. Praise the Lord. So teach them. Talk of them. 
And when thou stand in the way, when thou last down, and then verse number 8, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thine house and on thy gates. And so he says, look, I, I want you not only just to teach, teach it, but post it somewhere. Keep it focused here and keep it right at hand. Always have it at hand. So when a situation comes, I can put here. Here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. And always have it the focus of your eyes. I, I'm, not just, I'm just going through life, just getting through life. No, I've got to focus. There's something I can accomplish here, something I can do for God, something I can impart to my children here. Can I tell you this? You don't have long with your children. It seems like a long time, but I'm telling you, it just flies by. And one day you wake up and your kids are all gone. You say, where did all the time go? And you look back at some of the uh, uh, time, uh, time expenditure that you did, and you think to yourself, I wish I'd have spent more time with my children. I wish I'd have spent more time uh, uh, spending time with my kids. I wish I had taught them this. I wish I'd taught them that. There are several things I regret that I didn't learn from my dad. Now, I, I take responsibility for a lot of that, but a lot of it my dad didn't teach me. And, and I, I don't ever want to be a bitter person. I was bitter for a while because my dad worked so much and he didn't have a lot of time with us. But, but sometimes I said to my dad one day, I said, Dad, look, you, you, you repaired tractors and you repaired cars and you never taught me how to do that. You know what I was? I was the gopher. You know what the gopher is, don't you? Go for this, go for that. And so I'd go run and get this stuff, and then my dad would fix it, but he never took time. And I'd stand and watch him, but he never took time to say, son, look, this is how you do this. This is how you do that. And my son Joshua, my oldest boy, when I started pastoring in Jeff City, I used to have to fix the vans and the buses because we had nobody else to do it. So when I'd go to fix the buses, he'd come over there seven, eight years old with me. He said, dad, can I come with you? Sure. And so he'd lay under the bus and watch me do it, and he'd ask me questions, and I'd tell him what I'm doing. And then about, when he's about 10 or 11 years of age, one day we were fixing something. He said, Dad, can I do that? I said, do you know how? He said, I've watched you do it so many times. I can do it, Dad. I said, well, okay. And so I laid down there on the bus. I went to sleep, honest truth. I took a nap. Pretty soon he hit me like that. He said, Dad, it's done. I looked up. I said, son, did you do it right? He said, I sure did. From that time on, we have missionaries come and they have a vehicle problem or something. I say, if you've got any problem, my son might be able to help you. And as a young teenage boy, my son began to start uh, repairing. At 16, he went to technical school. At 18, he's out working. And they've had him at many jobs where they said, I've never had anybody that knows their mechanics like your son and does it as quickly and efficiently. So I give him a job, and a few minutes later, they're there. And I'm saying, what else you got me to do? Are you done with that yet? I'm done. Are you sure? Yes. Because, look, not because I'm so great, but there's a principle here I'm trying to get you, that we should be realizing that we have many things to teach to our children. The most important thing to teach to them is the Word of God and the commandments of God. Because, listen to me, if they are right morally they, and right according to biblical teaching, they will, they will make it in this life. Amen? And you won't be visiting them in jail. And you won't be crying those tears unless something comes in their life. But listen, when I, I want to be able to stand and look in the mirror and say, you know what, I taught my children right. Now, it's not just this matter of teaching, but it also says train up a children. What is train? Training means to discipline to, uh, to, discipline to character or to, to, to make, make them practice or perform until it becomes character. It's like training a dog to sit. All right, it's a little more, it's more, more than that, but it's a good way to put, it. you know, sit, sit, sit. They have become trained when you say sit, and they sit. Amen? Your children have become trained when, you, when, they, when they do what they should do. Until then, we're still in the training process. Amen? We should get our children to the place. I used to tell our young people at our Christian school, we're going to discipline you until you discipline yourself. And children, we're going to discipline you till you discipline yourself. When you discipline yourself, self-discipline, which is moderation, which is temperance, the Bible teaches, when you do that, then I no longer have to correct you. I no longer have to make you or discipline you because you are doing what you're supposed to do. That is when I have, that is when I have trained my child properly. Amen. Until then, i got to keep training. Amen. And so this is our responsibility. Now, I don't think anybody is, is not aware of that as a parent, but there are some pitfalls in, in children 
uh, uh, let, let's go, if you would, very quickly to Ephesians chapter 6 again. Uh, we should uh, teach our children to obey and honor our parents. Amen. They have to be taught. They have to be taught that. They have to be taught respect. You know, it's, it's, it's not really something that we have in us. Respect is not really a, a, a natural thing. It's not. It's something that has to be taught. I've seen parents that don't teach their children to respect adults. It, it bothers me. It aggravates me. It's not acceptable to have a child. The hoary head is to be honored. And I've seen it. I've, I've had kids kick me, and the parents do nothing. Kick me. In my own church that I pastored, come up, shake their hand, the kid kicks me, and the parents, ah. no, not, ah. I mean, they're my kid. I'd grab by the arm, and we'd do what round and round. You know where round and round came from, don't you? That's where that term came from. Amen. My children, if they ever smarted off to anybody, they got it. And they apologized. My children, when they did something wrong and I found out about it, they went to the person and apologized. And I went and checked and made sure they did. Even when my children weren't wrong, but, a, but a, an adult thought they were wrong, my children went and apologized anyway. Well, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't believe you did either. But the right thing to do is if somebody's got ought against you, you should go and make it right. That's biblical. And you will be a better person for it. And they used to, my daughter said the other day, she said, Dad, I used to hate it when you do that, but I'm so glad you made me, and I know now why you did that. And because I'm teaching you biblical principles, principles, girl, and biblical principles are not always pleasant. They're not preferred, but they are always blessed. Amen. And you will never go wrong by doing right. And by the way, you'll never go wrong by overdoing right. A lot of us think all we have to do is just enough right. Why not just go above and beyond that? Amen. The Bible talks about going the extra mile. Amen. If they take your coat, give them your cloak also. Amen. If they plight you on the right cheek, give them the left cheek also. What is he saying? Go overboard. Go above it. Amen. Uh, unity should be abounding in the church. Love should be abounding. What does the word abound mean? More than is expected. I should go beyond in respect of people. Amen. In honor, preferring one another. If you honor people like you're supposed to, then you will place them above you yourself. It won't be me. It'll be, now I want to put you up here. I want to make sure I treat you right. No matter how I'm treated, I want to treat you right. You said, tell my wife, tell my kids. I am not responsible for what those people do to me. I'm responsible for what I do to them. They may never treat me right, but I won't, I won't stand before God and have God say, you never mistreated that person. <clears throat> you never disrespected them. Amen. And we need to be so careful. Anyway, Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother. So you should teach your children obedience and respect. Obedience and respect. Go to Colossians chapter 3 and look at me at verse 20. Obedience and respect. Verse Colossians chapter 3 and verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things. Children, obey your parents in all things. You should teach your children to obey immediately and implicitly. Right away. And do exactly what I say. Partial obedience is actually disobedience. And listen to me, we teach our children it's okay to disobey because we let them get by with things. Amen. We know, you know, by the way, consistency, 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 consistency. Can I tell you something? If it's, if it's, if it's wrong, it's wrong all the time. Be consistent. Now, let me say this to you. I, I, I don't tell you what your rules and regulations should be at your home. That's your responsibility. You get in the Word of God, you think, you, you, you line up for yourself. But if it's wrong, and it needs to be wrong, then it needs to stay wrong. Because anytime you change, you now send a message that things are negotiable. There are some things that are not negotiable. Okay? I, we didn't have a lot of rules in our home. Can I tell you, you don't need a lot of rules. 
Okay? I'll give you the rules. You do what your mom and dad tell you. That's a pretty good rule. That's about all they need. You do what you're told to do. That's a pretty good rule. Anytime they don't do what they're told to do, they've stepped it. Never were they allowed to mistreat their mother. Unacceptable. Certain things unacceptable. You don't talk to your mother that way. And they never tried to talk to me that way. Kids don't do that to dads. They just do that to moms. Amen. That's why, they, that's why God gave us a, a dads. Amen. So that dads could take care of that. And so, now let me just give you very quickly here before we close. Uh, we'll go to Proverbs chapter 1 very quickly. Proverbs chapter 1. Teach your children to obey. And then Proverbs chapter 1. Here's probably the one I should have gone to first, but let's go look at it. Teach your children to obey. You and all authority. And I don't like when, I never, I never liked when they called a police officers pigs. I wasn't raised that way. I don't even like the word cops, though, though police officers use it. To me, they are police officers. An officer. An officer is a person of the, of, the, of the law or of authority. So that's a police officer to me. Because I was taught respect. See, I was taught to respect my teachers. Now, I didn't always do that, and I, but my daddy used to take me down to school every year and say, now, this is my son. If you have a problem with him, spank him, and then call me. When he gets home, he'll get another spanking. He never went down to the school and said, now, my son was mistreated. Never. And if I'd have been mistreated, if my daddy would go to the school, he would never tell me he did it. Amen. I was a, a, a freshman in college when we were watching a basketball game at my high school in Haven, and we were sitting there at the game. My dad said, he said, son, I, I never told you this, but I thought you got a raw deal when you were a senior. He said, I thought you were a better ball player than some of the guys playing. Well, I had thought that too, and I had a bad attitude, and I had to go to the coach and ask him to forgive me because of my attitude. And you know, my dad said, he said, I went and talked to the coach one time, but I never told you. My daddy was very smart. See, all he had to do is tell me that he agreed with me, and I would have been a terror. All you have to do is have your child say something, and you go to bad form with the authority, and you make the authority the bad guy, and you just destroyed authority in your child's life. And if you have a problem with an authority, go to the authority, but don't let your kids know it. They never have to know you and talk to them. My daddy didn't reveal it to me until I was out of there, that I could no longer if impact me. And I sat there as a, as a freshman in college and thought, my dad is a smart man. And I always used to think my dad was so dumb. You know that statement, when you're 16, you think your dad's so stupid. When you're 21, you, it's amazing how much he learned in five years. Amen. Amen. You must, you must understand that we are teaching and training children. Amen. Proverbs chapter 1, and look at verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. What you need to do is teach your children to fear God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You know, we don't want to make God a fearful God, because he's a loving God. And I tell you, there's two sides of this. There's two sides of being a daddy, Jesse. There's the love side and there's the fear side. The love side of me made me give my children what they needed, what they wanted, made me, made me hug them, made me do things with them. But the fear side of me, the, 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 the righteous side of me, made me put fear in them. If you do that, you're going to get a whooping. A whooping. You know what that is, amen? That's country for a spanking. You're going to get a whooping. Amen. And you know what? I got to the place when I snapped my fingers, my kids. See, that was my symbol. My daddy's symbol was this. He'd take his belt like this. When my daddy reached like that, my brother and I straightened up immediately. With my kids, snap the finger, they knew it was done. If I said the word, hey, they knew it was done. You've got to the edge. One more step, you're over. That's called the fear the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We need to teach our children to fear God. You think you can do what you want to and get by with it? You think God is never going to hold you accountable for that? 
Goodness, we've got a crazy Christianity today. It is not a biblical Christianity. It is a man-made philosophy instead of a Bible philosophy. Teach your children to fear the Lord. Don't make God mad, a bad person. But help them understand that God is, is a God of righteousness and holiness, and His expectations are for your good. But if you don't keep them, there are going to be consequences. You can't disobey God and be blessed. By the way, parents don't ever bless your children when they disobeyed you. Children disobey. You don't give them five bucks. Say, boy, you're a good boy. No, you're not getting any money today. You didn't obey me. Well, that's punishment. Yeah, that's part of it. That's the bad guy. That's when you have to put on the black hat instead of the white hat. Amen? And you have to do it. You don't like to do it. No, and if you like to do it, you're sick. Amen? <laughs> but you got to do it. It's part of it. we got to train our children. But let me give you here very quickly. I believe there are eight pitfalls to avoid in dealing with your children. Number one, we'll start with number one. Go to Psalm 71. We won't get through all of these this morning. That'll give me something to teach next week. Amen? That is, if I'm still around, you still want me to teach. Amen? Psalm 71. And verse number 5, look with me, uh, pitfalls in uh, raising our children, the, f the five, the eight pitfalls of dealing with your children or of ch a child rearing in Psalm uh, 71 and verses 5 through 8. It says here, For thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holding up from, thy, from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's, mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. I am as a wanderer under many, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day long. There is this failure of, uh, 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 of uh, t uh, the failure to begin training early. Training early. Dr. John Stormer wrote a book, Growing Up God's Way. It's a good book, classic book. He, sa he says this, psychology says, and I believe this is true, that a child's personality, his major makeup, and his major, uh, major uh, way he'll be in life is developed by the age of five. Children are, 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 are so, it's so valuable that you begin early. I believe this. If you have a child by, under control by the age of five or six, you'll have them under control. If you don't have them under control by the age of five or six, you're going to have a hard time getting them under control. If you wait until they're an adolescent, train up a child pre-adolescent the way you should go, you're in trouble. If you wait to start making the, making the rules and, and, and dealing out and teaching and training until your children get into their, into their 8, 9, and 10 years, of, but certainly after 10 years of age, you're in big trouble. My wife deals with the public schools. Okay? They have a fourth grade class over there that's a terror. An absolute terror. Four year, fourth grade, what is that? Nine years of age? Nine-year-olds, and they are mouthy, cussing, disrespectful, won't listen to anybody. They are trouble. Now, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, uh, but, but listen to me. Uh, somebody didn't do the job. I don't tell you, I don't, I don't know when you start with that, but you should have enough wisdom. Ask God to give you wisdom when it's time to start putting some, some screws down. I mean, I, I popped my kids on the backside when they were still in diapers. I put them to bed, and they were crying. I just pop them. I didn't spank them. I popped them. I, boom. So they, ah! I said, now go to sleep. So that it got their attention, now go to sleep. Authoritative voice. Learn to have an authoritative voice. You got an authoritative voice, Dad? Get you one. And can I tell you this? The more serious the situation, the softer the voice, and the lower the voice. That's why women aren't effective. Now, if you don't be quiet, and I go right in this here like this. But this works, brother. This works. By the way, proximity is a good thing. <laughs> now I'm telling you, if you don't settle down. They hear that. You know, I used to make my kids look at me. You look at me. Now you listen. You know what I used to say? Now you just tell me what I said. 
Now, I'm no great, great parent. I don't claim that. I don't say that my wife and I have been a success. But I'll just tell you something. I, just, I have learned that you have to start early with these kids. You can't let them become brats and then try to change it. You've got to start early. Now, if you, if you didn't start early, start where you're at. I and mean, start where you're at. Start now. I mean, if they're 18 years of age, start with them. Amen. Uh, my son, I think, got his last spanking when he was 18. So he said, well, that's a little too old. It may be. And maybe I was wrong. But you know what? My son still speaks about it. Not in a bitter way. He submitted to me or it wouldn't have happened. I'm telling you, he submitted to me or it wouldn't have happened. I never was the kind of guy to just grab something and hit. I said, son, what you did is wrong, and I feel like you need a spanking. Okay, Dad. Yeah, that tells me something, an 18-year-old to take that. Can I tell you this? My dad spanked me a lot, but I don't ever remember any of them. I remember that I got them, but I don't remember them. That means he didn't abuse me. See, discipline done right will not leave scars. See, you don't discipline in anger. You don't discipline because of your embarrassment. You discipline because it's the right thing to do. You discipline because it's necessary, because you know that if I don't discipline, my child will not turn out right. And you do it because it's what God is expecting, and it's godly discipline, not personal discipline. Amen. When you fly off the handle, you're out of control. Brother Walsh taught me this so much. Never react, always respond. Never react, always respond. The wise man considereth before he answers. The wise man considereth an evil and he passeth. We always got to take time to consider our actions because our actions are going to be judged by God. I'm going to give an account. And our actions can lead to either blessing or cursing, can lead to either uh, having a victory or defeat. Amen? When it comes to my children, I want victory, not defeat. Think about Samuel. John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb, didn't she? You think about Samuel, Samuel from a boy. Think about this. His mother prayed for him. She takes him to the priest at five years of age, I believe, because he was weaned. She takes him over there to Eli, and she says, Here, I'm giving my son to serve you. And Samuel just did exactly what his mama told him. At five years of age, a little boy says, That's what mama says to do. That's what I'm doing. And he was, a, and he was an, impe- an impeccable young man and an impeccable man of God. Not one thing is ever said bad about Samuel in the Bible. Not one bad word about Samuel. And his mother only had him till he was five years of age. She instilled in him by the age of five everything he needed to be a successful, godly young man. How long did Moses' mother have him? And, she had to, and when she got done weaning him, she gave him back to Pharaoh, and he grew up in an ungodly, a non-believing uh, 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 college education environment. But he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He learned from his mother by the age of five what he needed as a young man to say, that's not the path I'm going. You can teach me all your Egyptian doctrine and heresy you want to, but I know what I am. I know where I'm supposed to be, and I know what I'm going to do. I mean it. Get started early in raising your children. Let God give you wisdom. I'm not going to give you a curriculum here, what you need to say, what you need to do. That's what God gave you the Bible for. It's what He gave you the Holy Spirit for. That's what He gave you prayer for. God, I don't know how to deal with this, but I need you to help me to show me what to do. My child, and boy, I tell you what, I've cried a lot of tears over my kids, spent a lot of time in prayer to figure out how in the world I need to deal with this. I never went into discipline. I said, Lord, please give me wisdom. I want to make sure I'm doing this for the right reason and the right way. My kids was, I always sent my kids to their room. You know what my kids would say? Dad, I hated that. I wish you'd have just whooped us right away instead of making us go to the room. And when they go to the room, they have time to sit there and think, don't they? And they know it's coming. And that buildup is something, amen? And you walk in there and they're like, son, what'd you do? Guess right. No, dad, wasn't right. Well, why'd you do it? I don't know. That's not an answer. I don't know is not an answer. You see, what they got to do is admit, I did wrong. 
And I know why I did it. I chose to. I didn't want to do right. All right. You see, that's how we end up with repentance. You see, repentance has to come from honesty, which involves confession. If we confess our sins, he's faithful just. You know, we don't even know what confession is. You know what confession is? Go on to the altar and say, God, I looked at that woman and I lusted after her. Oh, just forgive me of my sins. You didn't confess a thing. Well, God, I, I saw that purse she had. I just wanted one so bad. Confession. I want my kids to confess to me. Confession means they recognize their sin. That allows them to have an opportunity to repent of their sin. Sometimes discipline was only talking. It talks about the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And they tell you this, they'd rather got spanking than got talking. <laughs> that talking. I didn't scream and holler at them. I just talked to them very plain, very bluntly, very pointedly. Talk to them about right and wrong. Talk about what do you think you should do? What if, I, what if you were the parent and I did it and I was your child and I did that? What would you do? You see, you got to get your children thinking. Thinking is important. God gave us a brain different than the animals so we could think, so we could understand, so we could get wisdom. And training a child, we got to use these things. Amen and amen. Don't fail to start early. Don't fail to start early.